Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for today's fireside chat. We're looking forward to all of your great questions, so please don't be shy. Feel free to start submitting your questions now while we wait for others to join in. Jerry is joining us from sunny California and I'm in Boston today. I'm just curious to know where everyone is logging in from, so if you wanna just find the question pane and um, type in your location, we'll, we'll take a look and see where everyone's at. Okay, I see a few people from California. We've got Chicago, North Carolina, a couple more from Massachusetts joining us, South Carolina, Miami, Charlotte, Minneapolis. So nice representation across the country today. That's great and others still joining, so we'll give people another minute or so. Miami, how exciting. I hope whoever's in Miami is staring out some uh, beautiful sceneries. Yes, I know, seriously. All right. Um, so I think we can get started now. Um, my name is Jill Davis and I'm part of the marketing team at Retention Science. Our team's very interested in helping e-commerce businesses grow and thrive. And today we're gonna discuss some themes and topics that were covered in a recent retail e-commerce event and discuss some key strategies for elevating your digital marketing programs and improving bottom line results. It is my pleasure to meet you all virtually today and introduce you to the host of our fireside chat, Jerry Zhao. Jerry is the CEO of Retention Science, working with brands like Target, Figs, Unilever, Rothy's, Dollar Shave Club, Birdies, and Charmin, to name just a few. Jerry's the founder of three SaaS software companies in email, CRM, and AI personalization technologies, and he was included on Inc. Magazine's 2019 list of most inspirational founders. I know he's excited to kick off this conversation focused on omni-channel and SMS marketing, smart content recommendations, and advances in personalization and behavioral marketing. Before we get started, we do have a quick poll for everyone. We're just um, curious to know a bit more about people's roles. Um, so I'm going to launch it here in just a second. Um, feel free to um, submit your response. Uh, we'll take a look at the results and then we'll get right into the conversation. So the, the poll again is what is your role or title? So are you a marketer? a founder, uh, maybe you're with an agency, or there's another role that, that best fits you. I see we have 53% voted, so we'll just give others a chance to submit and then we'll take a look. Okay. All right, so we have a lot of um, marketers here today with 78%. We have some founders at 11%, and then we have 11% that's, that's other that don't fit any of those categories. So thanks very much for participating. We hope that we cover all of your questions today. Um, again, feel free to find that questions pane. We're gonna be keeping an eye on that. Um, feel free to submit questions on any of our topics at any time, and we'll be addressing those throughout. Okay, um, so this is just a reminder that um, we're covering these topics in order, and you should feel free to submit 
um, the questions at any time. Um, we have also included um, the slide deck as a handout, so feel free to download it if you're interested. Um, that's in the handouts tab um, in the control panel. Okay, um, so to begin with, um, Jerry, let's talk a little bit about what omni-channel marketing is and its rapid acceleration along with that of SMS marketing. Hey, Joe, just really quick, uh, I think you might want to switch your setting. Uh, you're show right now it's showing your desktop. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, so um, I will switch to that. And um, yeah, why don't we start with um, omni-channel marketing and its rapid acceleration that we saw over the past um, year or so and touch a little bit on SMS marketing and I'll get those slides back up on the screen. Great. Well, first of all, happy Tuesday, everyone. And it's great to have you guys joining us today at this fireside chat. Um, I honestly thought about getting, I don't know if you can see my background, but I thought about getting uh, the fireplace setting from Netflix and just turn it on uh, in the background. Um, and uh, wherever you are, I hope you're having a good day, good afternoon, stay warm and uh, safe and healthy. So thanks again so much for joining us today. Um, we're so excited um, to kind of just talk about the general trends and everything that's going on in e-commerce. Of course, we know that with the pandemic, there's a really, really big surge trends in terms of bringing um, customers online. And, and because just uh, for a while, a lot of retail stores were, uh, were closed. So fun fact, um, last year in right around April, May timeframe, one of our brands that we partner with, uh, Charmin, had to actually turn off a lot of their digital marketing campaigns because products ran out. So how do we really kind of adapt in this sort of omni-channel environment and then really bring um, um, bring our, our our sort of our communication across the board? I think that's really, really important. Um, hey, Joe, you wanna, for the slide, I think you wanna probably maximize the slides so you could, if you see it, it was, Coming up for a second. So, yeah. in terms of in terms of omni, there we go. So, just go to the next slide. So, in terms of omni channel, I, I think one of the biggest questions on everyone's mind today is that we all know social media is, is number one driver for most direct to consumer businesses. So, whether you are one of the top ten um, marketing sites on Shopify, such as Figs or some of the cosmetic brands that we work with, like ColourPop, Jeffrey Stars Cosmetics. Um, one of the things that we know is that brands are spending so heavily on Facebook, Instagram to drive traffic, but then how do we connect the dots by bringing additional um, uh, content or even like one of the questions that we received prior to the webinar was even the use of Clubhouse. And then so that's those are all really, really um, interesting and kind of hot topics on top of mind right now for a lot of marketers. And then also there's certainly a, a rise of, of discussions around SMS. How should that be a part of our core um, marketing toolkit? Um, that certainly has been an ongoing discussion for a lot of brands that we partner with. And so when we think about Omnichannel, and, and Joe can go to the next slide, I hope some of us have seen a really wonderful um, um, campaign that Ty did. So Ty was able to uh, really successfully launch a, um, a campaign, hashtag Ty Hoodie, uh, with a partnership with uh, Jason Alexander. So um, this commercial launched in the middle of a Super Bowl, uh, I think it's around halftime show, and then complemented by a uh, um, uh, couple of tweets from Jason directly on, on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, Ty also built out a direct custom landing page uh, to actually get them, get participants to contribute to uh, charity events such as Feeding America. And then they also um, send out the, uh, their CRM program email, which is uh, through Retention Science. So this is a good example of sort of a cross omni channel campaign where uh, there's a lot of cohesiveness around um, different channel, different uh, similar messaging. And in this case, of course, Ty was able to get a celebrity endorsement, which oftentimes um, does help generate more additional eyeballs and 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 getting uh, int uh, more people interested in. So this we thought is a great um, sort of example of what an omni-channel campaign. In the next slide, you will see that 
there's a, a lot of other things that brands are thinking about that it's really, really important. Um, and, and we call this sort of the customer-consumer uh, uh, customer journey. And so, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of different channels and media and that you're all thinking about, whether it's uh, sending out a generic newsletter, whether it's paying uh, for ads and on, on, on media or on radio, or right now a lot of you are selling uh, direct through your e-commerce sites and store. So driving conversion is probably number one priority. So how do we really connect the dots uh, in terms of all the different types of media, types, uh, how do we fit each type of uh, channel into a part of a customer journey uh, is something that's really, really key to uh, the success of your overall campaign. And Julian, I think your slide went away again. There you go. And then so uh, another thing that we want to uh, show is that this is a great example from Rothy's. Um, again, the whole notion around how do we leverage omnichannel to uh, to help you grow. So Rothy's is a brand that we partnered for over five years. And one thing that we thought they've done really, really good job beyond um, just having the most uh, amazing products and a lot of great creatives is that they're always thinking about how do we talk, how do we talk to customers across different channels. So in this case, customer review is one of the uh, foundation and success to um, sort of their secret sauce. It's really their customers are becoming their advocates. They are selling uh, for Rothy's. So they are able to launch a hashtag campaign uh, across the various social media channel. And this is one way of how their marketers can find the various different, different type of reviews or feedback that their customers have left for Rothy's and then later on turn those um, organically generated customer reviews into a part of their marketing campaign. So these are, it, this is something that's been really, really effective for Rafi. So when you look at uh, their shoes, oftentimes there are thousands and thousands of reviews, and that's always a, a great way of um, additional validation for the products. And so we definitely encourage you to think about, are there other things that you can do to get customers excited, get in front of them, and then build a community around? And another example that we have here is uh, a lot of brands, I would say, half of brands that we partner with, sometimes they're running some sort of giveaways or campaigns. And so this is a great example of Perfect Bar. It's actually one of my perfect, uh, my, my favorite snack um, uh, um, when I'm short on time and I just need a, a, a sudden boost of energy. So I love Perfect Bars and we've been working with them for a couple of years. One of the things that we thought they do a really good job uh, with omnichannel campaign is being able to simply leverage uh, just the different followings they have across social media and email. And then in this case, uh, it's the, the goal is to grow their, uh, their consumer database. And then the next one is actually a partnership campaign. So a lot of times we also notice that brands are partnering with similar brands that have uh, similar target audiences. So in this case, um, Crest uh, partner with Indochino, which is a, for those of you who might not be familiar, uh, they sell custom-made suits that are really nicely tailored uh, based on uh, your fit. And then so one of the uh, things that they were able to do is partner with brands that we that has sort of this natural organic um, feel uh, and in terms of the audience types that they're going after. So Another thing that uh, for you guys to think about and just taking a brief look at some of the uh, our, our participants today, uh, I know some of you are selling nutritional supplements, some of you are selling um, apparel, some of you are selling or marketing for uh, personal products or, or uh, products for toys and children. Um, these are all great, great examples of think about how do we leverage um, just uh, uh, the other type of uh, similar uh, product lines or brands that you can potentially partner with to sort of expand uh, your outreach. And because at the end of the day, it's about being able to get you in front of uh, audiences that you probably wouldn't normally track, but leverage other partners to be able to get in front of. And then so that's also another great way to uh, make your Omni channel work for you in terms of generating engagement, getting audiences, um, getting following, and most importantly, uh, bring revenue uh, for the brand that you work for. 
Okay, so thank you, Jerry, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. I'm not going to be able to share my video camera. Um, I think it's more important for you to, to see the slides as we walk through this. Um, so um, we did have just a couple of questions, um, Jerry. I was hoping we could address um, one or two of them now before we continue on. Um, there's someone Absolutely. here um, who is um, a founder of a small but growing e-commerce company, and um, he's wondering the best way to determine what additional channels he should prioritize for 2021. Yeah, I think there's a lot of discussions right now around just uh, the longevity around Facebook. Um, so definitely we get that questions a lot. And so we're definitely encouraging brands to look into uh, channels that are maybe not as obvious or immediate uh, sometimes. So outside of social media, um, or when we say social media, I think most of us do think about Facebook and Instagram. Um, Snap has increasingly played a factor in terms of brand building or raising awareness, but we have actually noticed that because of the, the way Snap is built and the user experiences, um, it is great for you to get in front of millennial, Gen X, Gen Z type of uh, consumers. However, because of the, the way uh, Snap is mostly used, it's, it's not as effective in terms of driving sales yet. And then when I, what I mean by that is that it is still relatively uh, a little bit more difficult to be able to attribute sales directly to Snap. Um, we think SMS is definitely a, a very, very strong channel uh, because it's intimate and consumers have to self opt in in order for you uh, to be contacted by them. And so we certainly believe that SMS um, is increasingly playing a very, very important aspect of your omni-channel strategy. And we can, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then finally, we, we do encourage you to look into um, smaller but effective channels such as podcast. So joining uh, podcasts that are, uh, if you just go on the list um, like iTunes and, and various platforms that have a lot of um, podcasts or episodes available, uh, right now those tend to um, help you self-select audiences that are uh, interested in your products if you do your research right. Um, being interviewed or as a founder uh, share your vision, why your products are more superior. Maybe it's because the ingredients you use are more superior. Um, we work with a brand called Uprising Food, for example, so they do a lot of podcasts, um, and, and the founder, William, likes to really kind of articulate what his mission is help America eat healthier uh, by reducing the carb in your everyday consumption of a bread. So they bake with almond flowers and apple vinegar, and, and podcast has actually been, been a, a really, really big driver of their organic growth. Um, another one that we thought it would be um, is increasingly more interesting um, is just your traditional PR being, uh, being written about by uh, Business Insider, by BuzzFeed, so top 10 um, favorite um, you know, cosmetic brands or et cetera, wh whichever one that needs a little bit, like, can provide you with necessary accolades, industry accolades or validation. And then finally, we do love this example. I don't think necessarily all the brands have done a very successful job because it is difficult, um, is um, launching a community on Slack. So this one is a little bit newer. We have seen some brands done it very successfully. So one example that many of us probably have heard is Glossier. Um, has successfully launched a community within uh, the Slack, uh, launching their own Slack channel. So they have a customer representative or a marketer um, and they essentially actively engage uh, the channel uh, asking for product feedback. So that way their customers really feel like they're part of a brand's mission in terms of uh, merchandising or in terms of product innovation. Uh, what kind of foundation, what kind of lipstick color um, should they think about? What kind of scent or what kind of uh, flavors in, 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 the, in the CPG products that you're launching that's in a food category? We think that those are really, really good ways to bring your customers into your day-to-day -day and involving them. And lastly, we've also seen some successes in long, in having these sort of fireside chat or Zoom calls. So uh, a lot of brands are doing Zoom calls with their 
uh, their customers. So we certainly saw a lot of that at the beginning of the pandemic. So around April and May last year. Now, knowing that we're about a year into the lockdown, um, depends on where you are, uh, there's probably a decent amount of consume, uh, fatigue in terms of virtual meetup. So we just ask you to be kind of conscious around when you set those and keep those formats short and brief. So 15, 30 minute sessions around lunchtime, around end of the day, um, those tend to be pretty helpful. And then lastly, if you're doing, if you're selling energy drinks, if you're selling, um, uh, let's say leisure, uh, uh, high-end wear for sports, um, for, for um, active wear, uh, perhaps doing some sort of yoga sessions online, or again, we always ask you to think about how you can bring value to your customers. And then so create uh, programs around that uh, would also be additional um, uh, opportunities to, uh, in addition to your traditional marketing tactics. Great, thank you. Yeah, those are some really um, creative tactics there. I know we were speaking earlier today about Clubhouse too, which is another um, new option out there for brands. Yeah, Clubhouse is certainly interesting. And uh, for those of you who haven't checked it out, uh, very similar to kind of podcast format, but it's in real time. So you kind of feel like you're on, um, you know, on the same, like it's almost like a radio talk show and you're right there with the speakers and kind of like what we're doing today, uh, but no visual, no webcam. Uh, so um, someone that I personally respect uh, a lot and we've been working with since the start of her brand is called Schmidt's Naturals. Um, Schmidt's Naturals uh, uh, offer uh, all natural deodorant, no aluminum. And uh, we've been partnering with her and uh, Jamie and her team since the beginning. Uh, so one thing I've noticed is that she's very, very active on, on Clubhouse. Um, she's done a couple um, talks and interviews as well. So uh, for those of that are interested in checking that out, I think Clubhouse certainly is a new uh, channel and, and platform to engage your consumers as well. Great. Um, so yeah, now that we've addressed that, I think maybe we can jump back into the omni-channel discussion and talk more about um, goals for omni-channel marketing and then also um, strategies for reaching those goals. Yeah, so definitely we typically think about omni-channel campaigns at the, at the end of the day, whether you're a marketer, you're a founder, uh, we know that we have a very, very difficult task. Um, that's why uh, marketers are essential to every brand, to every successful organization. We always say that marketers are the ones that keep the lights on. Um, you guys have a very, very important job and also difficult. Uh, and that means that whatever we do, uh, I'm sure all, you guys are always thinking about how do we maximize sales? How do we maximize success? And so revenue is loud and clear. It's all about being able to uh, directly drive sales, uh, whether it's using lookalike audience targeting. So if you have some sort of CRM or email platform such as Retention Science, just make sure you're using uh, lookalike targeting, uh, Facebook lead ads, so you're really showing the right ads to the right customer type uh, so you can increase your efficiency and spend. And the next goal uh, that we often say is simply by growing your first party data. And what we mean by that is first party data is the ability to um, gain c customers and insights and information. So we've seen various different types of ways to gather information about your customers. And it's not just email or their phone number. Those tend to be the, the two most important and prominent data types that we as marketers want to collect. However, there's actually a couple other things that we encourage you to think about. One, um, maybe their birthday. So we could actually reach out to them uh, during their birthday month or birthday date. Uh, we encourage you to uh, potentially think about uh, their uh, zip code, their geography. So you could actually see whether or not um, where they're located. Um, and then so we could do different type of geo-targeting and then being able to actually um, uh, think about what kind of additional data could be uh, useful. Uh, Charmin, for example, asks for household size. So being able to know What's the size of your household? So we know how many toilet paper roll or uh, uh, product bundling that we can uh, promote to you. So these are all examples of what we call first party data. Again, first party meaning that these are consumer opted in and they give you more insights so you can be smarter about how to engage with them. So uh, certainly 
a number two goal in addition to revenue is just getting more customer information so you can be smarter about how to uh, market to them. And then number three goal for us uh, is centers around engagement. Um, so the early example you saw from Perfect Bar and Crest and this really awesome example from Starbucks. And sometimes um, even though this does not directly attribute to revenue or um, some other uh, sort of engagement type of uh, goals, the even if we're just getting a lot of feedback or likes or comments, these are good. But we I, a lot of a lot of marketers tend to consider these sort of icing on the cake. These are a little bit fluffier goal because again, it doesn't translate to revenue. But we have seen that in particular, personal care, beauty, and cosmetic brands, consumer engagement can lead to revenue. And again, these cosmetic beauty brands and some other CPG categories, high consumer engagement have proven to lead to, uh, uh, have proven to lead to greater revenue. So in this case, uh, whether it's a charity campaign, whether it's uh, just making aware that you're doing something good for the environment, like Blue Land, for example, reducing the, uh, the use of uh, plastics, these are all um, engage, uh, these are all campaigns that can generate a lot of engagement for your um, customers and then it provides further validation and then ultimately it will get consumers interested in peeking at your products and then looking at um, purchasing your products. So again, while these does not directly tie to revenue, uh, getting increased engagement is also a good focus for some of these omni-channel campaigns that we talked about. Great. Um... Well, before we move on to our second topic, I noticed there's another question, um, and it relates back to what you were saying earlier about um, SMS marketing and how that's mm -hmm. um, getting to be more of an important channel. And so the question is, um, SMS marketing is completely new to me. How should I get started? Yeah, so to get started with, um, and. So there was SMS, and what was the first part of the question, Joe? Sorry. Um, just that SMS marketing is completely new to them, and they're not sure yeah. how to get started. Absolutely. So to get started on SMS, SMS is actually quite simple and straightforward. So uh, there are many great, great providers out there to get you started on SMS. Um, and so uh, Resite Retention Science certainly um, you know, can be a platform to help you uh, send direct texting, uh, text SMS or MMS, uh, which includes GIFs or innovation um, in to reach out to your consumers directly. And so some of the things that we ask you to think about is that SMS is a very intimate channel, meaning that this device that we all have and that we can never leave behind, whether it's probably the first thing we check when we wake up in the morning or last thing we read before we go to sleep, um, we ask you to really think about what are the, uh, the message that you want to deliver through SMS. Um, most of the time, um, perhaps it's a, a promotion, it's a big offer, or if you have multi-channel campaign, it's really, really good to use SMS. So to get a jump start, you simply want to make sure you have um, set up a, for example, if you want a dedicated short code, which is a, a number that you can text your consumers from, make sure that you are um, uh, get yourself familiar with some of the rules and regulations around texting, um, and then um, certainly reach out to us and we can get you kind of set up everything in, in between. And one good example that I want to share with you uh, on SMS is that uh, one of our brands that we work with is called Draper James. Uh, it's a, a really wonderful apparel brand started by Reese Witherspoon. And uh, so when they, uh, when um, Big Little Lies are, um, uh, going uh, premier, uh, having a premiere on HBO, uh, which is Reese Witherspoon's show, um, they were able to come up with really clever campaigns of like during a show, uh, you know, text uh, this particular number or text keyword uh, Reese uh, at a number, and then they will like we'll be able to automatically uh, essentially subscribe a consumer into part of our contact list. So that's a very very popular example of an SMS campaign. Uh, using a keyword or using a um, um, being able that consumers be able to text you to opt in. So those are um, really really exciting campaigns to engage consumers uh, through omnichannel as well. Great. Um, so now we're going to actually switch to our second topic of the day. 
Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what SMART content recommendations are and also how that topic ties into the concept of data-driven marketing. Definitely. So a lot of marketers um, have reached out to us and say, hey, how do we be more personalized? How do we serve up the right content to the right customers at the right time? And um, we probably have all heard a phrase that content is king. And especially in, a, in an era where I think targeting online and ads going to be a, per, per potentially become less effective in the long term because there's a lot of regulation coming our way. Um, for those of you that invest in content and good brand building will ultimately be the ones that um, have the most success in the long term. So smart content, meaning that we're constantly A-B testing the content that we're serving up to our customers. Uh, smart content means that we're dynamically generating different types of content, whether it's UGC user generated content or um, creatives that we're making to A-B test a, uh, a lifestyle image versus a, 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 a an actual product shot. So for example, we've all, probably all heard that um, if you wanna, the, there's a famous uh, case study, I think it was by, Har uh, by Harvard University, that for charity organization, if you're trying to get raise a lot of money for a charity to ask for people for donation, the most successful ta marketing tactics in terms of smart content is not by asking for money, but by showing the condition of those that, uh, if this is a charity for clean water in Africa, show the image so there is that emotional connection. So for us, the definition of smart content is about using content to build those emotional connection with your customer, with your audiences, and then so we can really get them uh, to react to the content and then be, uh, and then ultimately reach the goal that you're looking to achieve, whether it's getting consumer engagement, which we talked about, or ultimately generating revenue. So we have a couple of examples in the following slides. And so one of the things that um, for us to think about is when you're thinking about content, whether it's a very, very brief, uh, to, um, you know, 280 uh, characters on Twitter or uh, coming up with a very um, uh, sort of attractive, appealing subject lines on, in your email, or what should you say in a text? Should you include a GIF? These are all important questions to keep in mind when you're thinking about smart content. At the end of the day, the more relevant content that you can derive, um, the more likely you will get a higher response rate. And that can be uh, an open rate, uh, that could be conversion for sales. Um, and then so what you're seeing right here is that, uh, think about A-B test your subject lines. When you think about email marketing, um, subject line has a direct impact on open rate. So whether or not a customer is gonna end up opening your email, clicking through and going back to your site to browse and read more, um, including an emoji or including the name of the consumer are, are two different tactics that we recommend you to try out. So one thing I want you to take away with from today's webinar is that if you can, Try your very best for every campaign you do. Include three to four subject lines. We don't want you to come up with 10 or 20 because that could be an overkill, but coming up with three to five of them, and we always, always, always recommend one of them to be a question. When you're asking a question, consumers are more likely to engage or because we're also most people are naturally curious. So if you're asking a question or the consumers are more, they're statistically proven that they're more likely to respond to you. Secondly, we want you to include emojis. Us as humans, emojis are cute, they're fun, they're dynamic, and so try to include emojis if you can, uh, if it's um, brand appropriate. And then lastly, we want you to, as much as you can, and if you're a, um, a user of retention science, you can certainly incorporate various personalization capabilities, such as using a merge tag, to include a product that you previously looked at or include the name of the customers that we're emailing. So by incorporating all these different elements, we're able to get really the notion around smart content, then we're able to get a better, um, better engagement, better open. Now, there's other type of content that we wanna encourage you to think about for A-B testing. Um, most of us probably depends on the season. Some of us do run promotions. 
So on the right hand side, we're also encouraging you to A-B test different kind of promotions, whether it's within an email, whether it's running on Facebook in an app format. So being able to test out not just 10%, but what if we offer a promotion that's $10 off instead of 10% off? So the notion around A-B testing different type of promotion, not just use percentages. Um, we love, love when brands run a, uh, a gift with purchase type of campaign. So again, if you're in a cosmetic world, um, we notice that um, including a gift back uh, with purchase, that's always proven to be really successful. If you have many SKUs, if you're selling a food product, giving out samples with every purchase of of, of a, a adjacent product has also also proven to be really helpful as well. So again, we want to encourage you to A B test these content uh, in terms of promotional offer, in terms of showing product, and finally images. Uh, for those of you that um, really sort of put a, a a great emphasis around the brand, the look and feel of your brand. Um, try different placements of, of content. So include uh, your brand logo, include a lifestyle images versus just very much big focus around the product. So we tend to um, encourage the brands that we work with um, to test out different types of uh, uh, messaging or different voice. So sometimes uh, having a, a voice of a, 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 a maybe focus on by gender. So knowing that men and women sometimes do have different purchasing behaviors. So use those opportunities to test uh, and drive smarter content um, is, is, is key for your success as well. Uh, next slide, we also have another example here for you. Um, we actually, um, yeah, we have a okay. question here, actually. I just want to jump sure. back to this one. Um, we have a question as it relates to um, smart content recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this person is asking if you could provide a bit more detail as to how smart content recommendations work. Um, for example, if somebody has an e-commerce site that sells shoes, what might the subject lines look like and how are they optimized? Oh yeah, great. So we have a lot of brands that actually do sell shoes. And so uh, oftentimes uh, a, a good way to start um, A-B testing or uh, some examples that I talked about, whether it's highlighting your different category shoes or flats versus heels or sneakers versus uh, wa regular walking shoes and be able to include different types of categories in the subject line. Uh, shoes is a great category if you're selling uh, sports athletic shoes, including a, a basketball, soccer ball emoji instead of actually showing shoes. So I think that's a great way of um, um, kind of figure out smart content uh, approach. So instead of saying shoes, you know that you're, uh, a, a big part of your audience is actually spend, uh, they're buying your shoes for sports. Or um, Birdies is another great brand that we partner with and they sell in-home um, slippers. So instead of actually showing shoes, why don't we show homes or cooking or something that indicates comfort or uh, things of that nature to inspire uh, our customers to open that email? Uh, I think those are great examples to, to think about. Uh, same thing, you can do that in SMS as well, including emojis and um, of shoes or heels. Um, sometimes uh, just because we all like to um, uh, see hearts or things that are very, very positive. So including different colors of hearts um, that maybe are, so we know that um, Birdie's top sellers are black, uh, black flats. And then so including a black heart emoji uh, might be another good example uh, of test uh, as well. And then as, as I mentioned earlier, ask a question. Um, ask your customers in a subject line, um, do you need another pair of shoes? Or um, if you're looking for customer reviews, like the ones that we saw from Rafi's earlier, um, include your hashtag or without or without it, and then simply ask them the questions. Would, do you like your shoes enough to recommend to a friend? So those are all examples of maybe incorporating things that you think that you want to test out, um, and then you know A/B test. And we always say that. Um, direct to consumer or e-commerce, the beauty of these campaigns that is that you pretty much will be able to find out the results the day after. So we encourage you to test it, push your boundaries and try as many things as you feel comfortable. 
Great. Um, we do have another question that um, relates back to our first topic. So mm -hmm. I was thinking we could tackle that one now before um, moving on. Um, so this is relating to Omnichannel and um, this business owner is wondering about any rules of thumb or general timelines in terms of um, testing and validating a new channel. Yeah, great question. So we think that um, when you're testing a new channel and just like we're testing uh, when we first test an ad on Facebook and for those of you that are working with an agency, I think the most common thing that we've all heard is that you need to give it more time, you need to give it more time, right? And then so I think that it's really important that there's proper resources and investment that are being put um, into a channel um, before we basically essentially pronounce, like pronounce whether or not it's effective or not. So based on your budget, um, if let's say if you have your monthly marketing budget is around 500,000 and uh, right now, you know, 80% of it, 400,000 is around pay media and then 100,000, which is 20% is sort of spread across like affiliate marketing, uh, CRM, and just anything that are a little bit more ad hoc or partnership marketing, like the example we show from Crest and Indochino. Um, we typically say that if you're looking at it from a marketing budget perspective, um, whenever you test a new channel, um, you want to put enough of budget behind the channel in order for you to see the impact, uh, but at the same time without sort of distracting your core business, because like, we know that at the end of the day, you need to de deliver a consistent uh, revenue and meet the goals that you set up for the year. So um, 10 to 20% of your total marketing budget tend to be a really good gauge on how much to invest into a new channel when you're looking at your omni-channel strategy. And then in terms of how much time to allocate, so if you're thinking about testing into SMS marketing, um, I would say give it about uh, 60 to 90 days is a pretty good gauge. And again, of course, it depends on your uh, the size of your and the scale of your business. If you're a Unilever, um, you could probably tell how effective a new channel is within 30 to 60 days, just because the nature of your scale. Uh, if you are a smaller startup um, running on Shopify and just getting started, and because your customer base is smaller, you might need to run a little bit longer because you have um, you need a little bit more data points to give you to kind of help you prove out your own hypothesis. So um, I would say allocate about 10 to 20 percent of your total marketing budget for a new channel when you want to test and depends on the scale of your business uh, 60 to 90 days which is two to three months tend to be a good time frame for you to develop confidence in a new platform or channel or new vendor um, very very similar to how sometimes you want to run a pilot uh, with a new partner etc or new agency when you're testing out a new agency or a new pr retainer firm uh, three to six months um, tend to be a good gauge for that. PR probably takes longer just because you have involves in pitching reporters, et cetera. But um, so we've seen that brands that brought on new service agencies, six months tend to be the standard. Uh, but a channel where you're investing marketing dollars, I think three to about two to three months max is a good uh, uh, time frame. Okay, great. Um, that is super helpful. And we are um, going to head into our final topic for today, um, which is personalized marketing um, and behavioral marketing. Um, but before we do that, I think a lot of our topics that we've covered today um, relate to the importance of customer data and really understanding your data. So I was wondering um, if you could cover just for a minute or two the importance of working with a partner who can help you understand and structure your data yeah absolutely i think that um as data becomes more available and accessible right and mo many of us um typically start on shopify and shopify has a lot of data available to us and it's really about analyzing it understanding it uh, google analytics tend to be uh, sort of that source of truth in terms of marketing attribution um, some of the brands that we work with also attach Tableau for analytic purposes or so it really depends on if you're an enterprise, if you're a startup brand and there's a lot of other um, uh, analytics tool available like Mixpanel. Uh, Retention Science certainly provides um, a, a pretty rigorous, uh, robust set of analytics for you on a CRM side. 
Um, when you're looking at a new partner or seeking help from a um, external consultant or just having uh, a member of your team, your marketing team, to look at how to sort of assess the data um, to really enrich the way you think about and formulate your strategies, we always say that when you're getting started, don't overkill by, have, by, by bringing in so much data. Um, it's important to prioritize data because sometimes we do say that um, garbage in, garbage out. So you want to make sure the data quality is good. So having a partner who can help you assess the quality of your data is really, really important. Uh, secondly, uh, being able to access data in a very clean and simple manner. So that's where a lot of businesses and especially e-commerce business today are using data connectors like Segment, Zapier, um, to be able to easily import export data through different channels. So we certainly are part of the ecosystem where we can have an open API to bring data to other um, ecosystem as well. So that's a, another good way to think about um, uh, assessing data uh, through a partner. And then the last thing that I would say is um, for us, data is as good as you can make sense of it. So sometimes marketers are excited by the prospect of data, but then sometimes half the time we also hear that they're overwhelmed by the amount of data that can be available to them. So oftentimes we say, hey, pick three or five different data types that you think that can um, really incrementally add value to the way you think about your omni-channel strategy. So for example, if you have products that are uh, available in retail stores, so Birdies, for example, um, they're available at all the Nordstrom stores. So in, uh, in retention science, they bring zip codes and they bring in states. Um, and then so they're able to do geo-targeting type of campaigns. Uh, so the, again, don't need to necessarily incorporate every single data that's out there just because that you might end up overwhelmed yourself. Start small. Let's learn how, we always say, let's learn how to crawl before we walk. So hopefully that's helpful. Great. Thank you very much. So now I think we are ready to head into our final topic um, is advances in personalization and behavioral marketing. Um, so here we see some of the various ways AI can support highly personalized marketing. Um, could you talk just a little bit about what this means in terms of delivering content that is personalized for each individual customer? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as we kind of wrap up today's uh, webinar, I just want to thank you guys all again for joining us. I know a lot of us are just kind of virtual now, so we really appreciate you even just listening in. And again, please um, remember that the, the, um, the handouts are available for download um, on your right-hand panel where it says handouts. Um, and so we've talked a lot, a lot about just optimization and being able to, the use of data or um, uh, how do we be more effective in our subject line being smart, uh, in terms of smart content. Um, some of the things we have not talked about in the last couple, um, 20, 30 minutes is around the frequency and timing of delivery. So um, us as, as a brand, and how often do we reach out to customers is equally important in terms of content. So some of us reach out daily, some of us reach out maybe bi-weekly, some of us maybe reach out once a month. And that really has a lot to do with um, the number of products we sell, the number of content that we have, or how we're adding value to our customers. I always say and describe marketing as that we only have a few opportunities to get in front of the customers. And then so we really want to make every interaction as valuable as we can, because at the end of the day, it's all about adding value to the customer. It's really about uh, bringing something in meaningful insights um, to our end audiences. So it's kind of like, you know, pre pre like when we're pr preparing for this webinar, we want to make sure there's specific action items. So we're trying to be um, as specific as we can to give you something that you can take away with. And similar to what you're doing with your customers, if you're writing um, a blog on, to put it on your website, make sure you're adding value to your customers. So uh, I'll give you a great example. Um, always, uh, um, always or 10 packs um, are customers, uh, are, are partners of retention science. And they are in the uh, process of really figuring out what's their content calendar uh, look like for 2021. 
And then what is the right email frequency and how often should they reach out to their uh, consumers? Should they heavily promote the products or really by focus on a content strategy that's adding value to consumers? So they like to do the latter, which is less promotion, but focus on bringing value and knowledge to their consumers. So what are some of the examples of that? They want to focus on um, helping their consumers think about uh, nutrition during the time of your period. And then so you can really think about how do you eat healthier? How do you prepare um, and shop for foods that are good for during a time that you're uh, maybe experiencing uh, blood loss? Um, so those are really good concrete example of value added um, content for your consumers. And then so whether or not it's sending out these type of communication once a month or twice a month, those then you can base on the content or the value you're adding. Because sometimes you could say, hey, um, we have a lot of new products that we're constantly rolling out. I want to get in front of our customers once a week. You can do so. Um, but you just want to make sure that whenever you're reaching out to your customers, you really have something to say. Um, and then don't forget to use segmentation to um, and some of those um, uh, the AI optimization uh, capabilities within retention science for those of you that are working with us. And for those of you that are just learning more about AI and how it can help you with omnichannel, uh, look at your existing vendor and just ask for features that help you kind of create a, a, a formulate a strategy that can, at the end of the day, sort of give the customers what they want, uh, which is um, insights to live a better life, delight them. Sometimes we have a lot of brands that are uh, really funny or they cater to parents. So they're really helping parents think about uh, self-care because their whole lives are dedicated to their babies. Um, so think about who are your target audience and, and develop a content strategy around that. And then the rest of what you see here uh, will come true. Um, so yeah. Great. Um, well, we did just have a question come in as it relates to this topic. Um, this one is, how can I know if I'm tracking the right data to personalize mm. and improve my marketing programs? Oh, great question. So um, I think tracking the right data, um, it, it really comes down to what you're testing. So going into every single test and when you're kind of developing smart content, if it's an ad, you certainly want to see whether or not your um, uh, CPA are coming down when you're uh, placing Facebook ads. So being able to show different type of ad creative uh, to different set of uh, lookalike audience on Facebook. Ideally, your CPA should come down because your efficiency per ad is going down. Um, sorry, your efficiency is going up and therefore your spend is coming down. If you're not selling, you're simply looking to drive engagement like the Starbucks charity or the Thai hoodie example that we kicked off the webinar today, um, then your goal, your data that you're tracking is whether or not we're getting more engagement, are we getting more site traffic visit, um, and then ultimately are we getting more uh, donation donated to Feeding America. So that would be another example of like the kind of data you want to track. And then finally, just because I would imagine most of you do have the responsibility of bring sales for the brand and the e-commerce business that you operate and manage. Um, I think revenue is always a good, good um, benchmark to your success. And then, um, and most of you depends on, again, the scale you are and, um, and also how many different channels you have. Then the conversation around attribution uh, it has always been a hot topic in the past couple of years as well. And there are different systems that help you sort of allocate and attribute 20% um, to your CRM, 30% to your ads, because the, the customers probably click through many different types of um, um, uh, 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 targeting campaigns that you have serve up in front of them. So just keep in mind that attribution is also important when you're looking at the success of your overall um, marketing programs. Very nice. Um, I think we have time for one more question that just came in on this topic. And um, the question is what types of customer behaviors are tracked and how do they inform the marketing campaigns? Hmm. Is this uh, is this specific to retention science or just kind of general on the website or? It seems to be an, a general question. Okay, great. So um, I think some of the important behavioral uh, data that you want to pay attention to. So for those of you who have Google Analytics set up, one of the things that I personally really enjoy looking at is the waterfall analysis. It shows you to track like how 
your customers are browsing your site. So if you're a startup brand, uh, the About Us page seems to be really, really important, and, and that's pretty proven and true. So you want to have a very descriptive About Us page. So I think Everlane is a great, a, a great brand that does a great job of showcasing their back end, um, their, their warehouse, their manufacturing process, and how they cut out the middleman and deliver a quality product to uh, an, average, um, an everyday consumer at a lower price. And so looking at those kind of how your consumers are browsing and interacting with your storefront online, it kind of helps you think about where to focus your energy and really spend time to beef up the content around those areas. If you think that um, they're spending more time on your product pages um, or specific product pages, or they're interested in learning about your uh, charity. So for example, uh, we have a lot of brands that do a lot of give back to the community that they are in so um, if you know that that's a very very important aspect of your business and success then think about coming up with an impact report so from a marketing angle you can come up with an impact report on how many um, what kind of uh, like donation you've made to the charity or the cause of your of, of the interest or what's the result of the um, of you donating uh, 20,000 pair of shoes uh, in case of Rothy's or Birdie's. Like, so think about uh, looking at those data to help you think uh, to drive your uh, marketing strategy. And then on the retention science front, for us, we have a built-in AI that is really tracking how consumers are interacting with us. So we, and as a result, uh, as you can see on the slide, we can optimize for send time delivery. So we know that Joe is an early riser, so we should get in front of her at 7 a.m. before she gets her kids ready for school. But Jerry's a night owl, and when Jerry's buying products is literally late at night around 11 p.m. So we want to be able to use these kind of data uh, and insights on our uh, from our consumers and, and then to drive the way we engage them. And then so with, in the case of retention science, those components are completely automated or serving up product recommendations or offers that we talked about earlier. Great. Um, that is super helpful. And Jerry, I just want to thank you very much as we wrap up. Um, I know in your time with Resi, you've worked with major brands and also smaller but growing e-commerce com companies, and you've shared some great um, examples with us today. Yeah. Um, yep. And as actually, we... just on that, on that, I didn't realize, I, I love Daniela and Fun and Function. That was a great, I, we work with we feel so privileged to partner with a lot of amazing brands and Fun and Function is probably one of the most thoughtful brands out there because they're really dedicating their offering to um, children with needs. And, and um, I actually in families, we, we have um, I have a nephew who has uh, autism and, and kids with special needs. And so for those of you interested, please check out Fun and Function. It's a really, really wonderful offering that is very thoughtful and they have moms that are running their customer departments. And so again, talking about using data, I think Fun and Function is one of those brands that really just kind of thoughtful about how they approach their customers. Um, so yeah, thank you, Jill. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, so as we wrap up, I just want to mention that Retention Science uh, started as a team of data scientists and e-commerce experts. And as we've grown, we've stayed true to the mission of helping e-commerce businesses succeed. If we could leave you with one thought today, it would be that it's an exciting time for marketers and e-commerce companies with many opportunities to harness your customer data and employ proven strategies to achieve results. So we are going to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you to everyone for being part of today's fireside chat, for submitting your questions, and we hope you'll continue to bring your big questions to us as you look to the future and strive to drive more online sales and grow your businesses. You can request a conversation with one of our experts by visiting our website and clicking the request a demo button. You'll also find webinars and additional content on these topics and more on our website. In a few days, you'll receive the webinar recording in your email. It would be helpful for us if you could take just a minute after the webinar to complete the short feedback survey that appears on your screen. And on behalf of Retention Science, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.